muted. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. I wanted to thank Justin again uh, for the nice introduction and for the inv invitation and the opportunity to um, be part of this wonderful lecture series. It's a real honor to get invited to do this and I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, my name is Paul and as Justin mentioned, uh, I'm an associate professor of biology at uh, Cal Poly Humboldt um, where I teach ecology, uh, marine biology and invertebrate zoology uh, in the Department of Biological Sciences um, there. And I wanna share some of the work that my students and I are doing um, that involves quite a bit of the Lost Coast and Cape Mendocino. Um, and I, I just wanna intro introduce myself as an ecologist. By training, that's what I am, I'm an ecologist. And for me, the fundamental goal of ecology is to really understand how organisms interact with their environment. And, oops, sorry. Just as with all of life, um, the one constant in an organism's environment is, is change. Um, and that could be spatial change in physical or biological conditions across local and global environmental gradients. Or that could be temporal change um, in temperature or precipitation associated with seasons. Um, regardless of the type of change, environmental change is really the norm of nature. Um, and so understanding how organisms respond to environmental change and this fundamental goal of ecology is, is nothing really new in the field. Um, it's actually been the goal of ecologists for decades. Um, but I feel like today this goal really takes on new meaning and some urgency uh, to focus our efforts on understanding how organisms are gonna respond to a rapidly changing global environment brought about by things like the overharvesting of top predators, the introduction of non-native species, uh, disease outbreaks and epidemics, and changing climatic conditions. And so the research that my students and I do really focuses on understanding how individual organisms use um, uh, respond, I should say, to changing environmental conditions, and really what are the ecological consequences of those responses um, at different levels of organization. So we can think about the environment affecting individuals, but the responses of those individuals has consequences at the population level, which then has consequences for communities and, and ultimately for whole ecosystems. And so what we do to, to sort of do this, we really focus on species that have disproportionately large effects on ecosystems or are disproportionately important in determining the structure and function of natural ecological communities. Things like what we call foundation species and keystone species. And, and so I just want to define what those are to avoid some jargon here. So we can think of foundation species as species that are defined as having really large effects on community structure by modifying environmental conditions, um, also modifying species interactions and, may, and resource availability within their systems just through their physical presence alone. So in marine systems, some of the classic examples of what we think of as foundation species um, include things like forest forming kelps, like the bull kelp you see here, which is common along our coast. Um, on the East Coast, and less commonly in California, but still in some places, California, things like salt marsh grasses, like we see in Humboldt Bay, for example. Um, reef building corals, um, as other examples. All of these, um, and, and for you folks that, that like to walk in the redwoods, redwood trees are a great example of a foundation species. All of these species share in common this idea that the physical presence of each of these species provides things like food, habitat and shelter for diversity of other species in the ecosystems that they inhabit. And so a keystone species is a species that we can think of that also has a disproportionately large impact on the ecosystem, but that, that effect is really large relative to its abundance. Um, and so a keystone species is sort of analogous to uh, an arch or a keystone in an arch. 
Uh, basically, the species, just like the keystone supports the arch, the presence of this species supports the whole structure of the ecosystem and prevents it from collapsing. <clears throat> and so keystone species can actually affect communities in a number of different ways. So for example, predatory sea stars that prey on things like sea urchins or sea mussels can prevent the overpopulation of those urchins and mussels um, and keep kelp forests and intertidal rocky shores healthy. Beavers are also a great example of ecosystem uh, engineers or keystone species that actually engineer their ecosystem by building dams that can actually transform the environment um, that they live in in a way that allows certain other species to survive and flourish uh, in those habitats. <clears throat> And we can even think of something like a honeybee as a keystone species, as they pollinate a wide variety of, of different plant species, ensuring the continuation of those plants' life cycles. <clears throat> now, as we know, global climate change is affecting these important species. Um, and as a result, the structure and function of ecological communities and the ecosystem services they provide um, is gonna be compromised by the, the negative consequences of climate change on these important foundation and keystone species. <clears throat> so one of the major environmental changes associated with climate change in the marine realm is ocean acidification. Um, and we can think of ocean acidification where increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide is driving increasing absorption of carbon dioxide by the oceans. And this comes along with a corresponding increase in the carbonic acid in the water. And we know that about a third of all of the carbon dioxide released from fossil fuel combustion is actually trapped in the world's oceans. And so if it weren't for the oceans, we'd actually be a whole lot worse off in terms of the effect of fossil fuel combustion on climate change. So the ocean is acting as this nice big absorbent sponge, but this has real consequences for the ocean. And so as carbon dioxide levels continue to increase, they have a direct impact on the acidity of the ocean. And you can see here, this is a graph here showing rising levels of carbon dioxide um, in red there, um, and then rising levels of CO2 in the ocean in green that parallels that increase in atmospheric CO2. Um, in red, and then the, the concomitant decrease in ocean pH in water off the coast of Hawaii. <clears throat> now, global oceanic pH has actually declined by 0.1 units since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and 0.1 units might not seem like a lot, but pH is measured on a logarithmic scale. And so a change in uh, 0.1 units is actually about a 23 to 24% increase uh, or decrease, I should say, in pH um, since that time. So relatively large change. And further forecasts actually predict a further reduction of 0.35 units just by the end of this century, by the end of the 21st century. So this rate of change is actually pretty scary. It's unprecedented in our geologic record. Um, and so you might imagine that such a, a drastic and rapid change has motivated quite a bit of efforts to understand what the biological implications of ocean acidification might be for marine organisms. And one big potential implication is to calcifying marine organisms. And so those are marine organisms that build their shells or their exoskeletons out of calcium carbonate. And so as I mentioned, as the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide, it creates carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid actually steals carbonate ions out of the ocean from the water that are needed for those calcifying marine organisms to build and maintain their shells. So ocean acidification has potentially really negative consequences for these marine calcifiers. And the acidification of our world's oceans has real consequences. And actually, there's some real consequences that hit pretty close to home here on the West Coast. Uh, this is from a recent study that found that ocean acidification is dissolving the shells 
of baby Dungeness crabs, which as we all know is a key commercial and recreational fishery here in the Pacific Northwest. And this is actually just one of hundreds of, of studies that are documenting these negative effects of ocean acidification on calcifying marine life. So what I'd like to share with you today is just a little bit about how we're using the Lost Coast as part of a natural laboratory uh, for studying how global change affects marine life and then what we're finding out and hope, hopefully convince you that not all of what we're finding out is bad news and there's actually a little bit of optimism here in this neck of the woods regarding the effects of ocean acidification on some of these keystone and foundation species in the marine realm close to home. <clears throat> so one of the things I want to point out is that environmental variability is really an intrinsic characteristic of coastal ecosystems along California. And, and those of you living here on the coast of California know that very well. And so there's changes in carbon dioxide, ocean pH, temperature, nutrients, and a whole lot of other factors. Um, that are the result of these dynamic processes that occur along the coast, such as upwelling. So along the California coast, so deep cold water um, in the Pacific Ocean normally holds much more carbon dioxide uh, than water near the surface. And fossil fuel emissions are just adding more CO2 to that already carbon dioxide rich water. Um, and then seasonally, wind blowing across the ocean is gonna push surface water uh, offshore of California um, between April and September each year usually. And what, what that means is that that deep cold carbon dioxide rich water that's, that's below the surface gets drawn up near the coast to replace that wind blown water. <clears throat> and so in this region, populations of calcifying marine organisms are actually exposed to natural variation in ocean pH and carbon dioxide due to this seasonal upwelling. And like in other coastal regions around the world, the natural variability produced by this intermittent upwelling um, can produce ocean acidity that's actually far greater in magnitude than what is predicted to change due to ocean acidification by the end of the century. Why that's important is that that may have actually promoted or prompted the evolution of tolerance to low pH or acidic seawater in the marine organisms that have experienced this intermittent upwelling um, throughout their history. And so really this region actually provides what, what I think of as this natural laboratory for studying the tolerance of marine calcifying organisms to the potential threat of ocean acidification in the future. And so one of the many things that my students and I, my lab and I have been working on is, is the tolerance of California mussels to ocean acidification on the North Coast of California. And so for those of you who don't know, California mussels are key foundation species that provide homes for hundreds of other um, algal and invertebrate species on the coast. And they're a rich food source um, for species ranging from sea stars, uh, even to humans. And we've been working at, at two locations north of Cape Mendocino and two locations south of the Cape. And the reason that this is important is that south of Cape Mendocino, um, the, the acidity of coastal waters or the pH of coastal waters rarely falls below 7.75. And I just wanna note here that the pH of ambient seawater is typically, it hovers around 8.0. So the, the water south of Cape Mendocino, the pH never gets too, too low. In contrast, if you go to the coastal waters north of Cape Mendocino, they experience this recurrent, strong, but highly variable upwelling regime, meaning that the organisms on the coast there get exposed to this uh, deep, uh, carbon dioxide rich, low pH water during the upwelling season. So what we can think of is north of Cape Mendocino, there's this ocean acidification hotspot that we like to call it, that imposes more va variable and potentially much more stressful, low pH acidic water conditions for the mussels. But 
upwelling also brings nutrients with it up to the coast as well. And so it also allows for higher concentrations of phytoplankton, which are the food for mussels on the coast um, to develop near shore. So not only does it, it, it bring um, potentially more stressful conditions to the mussels in terms of lower pH, it also provides them with enhanced environmental opportunity um, for growth because of the additional food inputs into the system. And so what we've been doing is we've been characterizing the pH variability in the ocean north and south of Cape Mendocino. And we've done this by installing these intertidal pH monitors or sensors that measure pH um, in the intertidal zone every 15 minutes. You can see one pictured here. This is out on Cape Mendocino. We've also been using some historical data um, that's been collected by um, some monitoring networks and some other universities near our study locations um, that have really shown similar patterns of variation in ocean pH over several years. So I don't wanna to show too many uh, data graphs in this lecture here, but I did wanna show this one here. So on the left, you have intertidal pH. Again, pH is measuring the acidity of the water. Um, and the two um, bars on the left, the green and the orange bars on the left represent data that were collected from north of Cape Mendocino. And then the purple and the magenta bars on the right represent data that was collected south of Cape Mendocino. <clears throat> um, and what you should be able to see there is that there's much greater variability in ocean pH north of the Cape than there is south of the Cape. And then just on the right hand side, this is data that's taken from a sensor installed on the pier at, at Trinidad Head. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Humboldt State University data um, showing consistently high levels of pH variation from year to year. You can see that the ocean pH off of Trinidad Head there ranges from 8.4 all the way down to as low as 7.2, which again is as low as what we're predicting for global oceans under uh, ocean acidification by the end of this century. So we have this really high variability in ocean pH north of Cape Mendocino, less so south of the Cape. And then just here on the right-hand side, these are the sensors that we've installed. On the left-hand side is the sensor um, in Trinidad in orange. On the right-hand side of the, uh, uh, the top right upper graph in purple is the sensor we installed in Cape Mendocino. And again, what you can see is that the variation in the pH of the ocean water um, is more than twice as variable in Trinidad um, than it is on Cape Mendocino. So much more variable north of the Cape than south of the Cape. Um, my students and I have also collected weekly samples of ocean water at, at these different locations north and south of the Cape. Um, and we can analyze chlorophyll A. And what chlorophyll A tells us about is the amount of phytoplankton that's in the water. And that's important because phytoplankton is what mussels feed on. Um, and, and what I want you to see here is that food for mussels is generally much higher north of the Cape than it is south of the Cape. So we have strong variation in exposure to upwelling events north and south of Cape Mendocino, resulting in really consistent site-to-site -site differences in ocean pH and, and food available for the mussels as well. And so what we wanted to know is how is this variation affecting the mussels that live on the shore in these different locations? And so we did a field experiment, a pretty extensive field experiment at these, at these four different locations where we measured the growth of over 200 mussels, small mussels, at each of these four source locations. And this is actually not as, as hard as it might seem. This can be done by marking each mussel with a spot of colored nail polish and some clear coat that you see here on the left. And then you can file a small triangular notch into the lip of the mussel. I'm hoping you can see that there on the slide as well. Um, and then what you can do is you can come back in several weeks or even months later, and you can measure the growth of the muscle relative to that notch that we carved into the muscle initially. And this is something that I wasn't sure was gonna work, but we did a pretty decent job. We actually recovered about 50% to 60% of the marked muscles in the field after we let them grow out there. Um, for uh, a few months. And what I wanna show you here is that we found that those mussels north of Cape Mendocino, 
grew about 35% faster than those muscles from locations south of Cape Mendocino. <clears throat> And so in a way, this is, was a surprising result. Um, off the waters of California, as they become more acidic, some scientists have actually found, and mainly in Southern California, that California mussel shells have been weakening over time, presumably due to increasing, increasingly acidic oceans. Um, and so what we actually expected to find was that mussels from these OA hotspots north of Cape Mendocino should be doing poorly under these, these highly variable and, and much more acidic conditions than south of the Cape. And they should be growing less and having weaker shells than mussels um, from outside those hot spots south of Cape Mendocino. But instead, what we found is that the mussels from those ocean acidification hot spots are actually growing more. And they also, I didn't show the data here, but they also have thicker shells than the mussels from outside the OA hot spots south of the Cape. So they're actually doing better. And the idea here is that presumably because these mussels have much more abundant food north of Cape Mendocino, that is allowing them to be more resistant to exposure to these, these low pH conditions that they get during seasonal upbowing. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to switch gears here a little bit um, from mussels to sea stars. Um, and a sea star is not usually the first example that comes to mind when you're picturing a voracious and fearsome top predator. Um, but however, many sea stars, that's exactly what they are. They're, they're awesome top predators in the ecosystems that they inhabit. Um, and, and in many cases, um, particularly in nearshore coastal zones, many sea stars are these keystone species that have major impacts on the diversity and the functioning of their ecosystems. And so the most well-known keystone sea star is actually a sea star that's common to the north coast of California, including the lost coast. And that's the ochre sea star. That's the purple, orange, and, and mostly brown uh, sea stars that you see in the intertidal, the rocky intertidal zone um, in, in Humboldt and Mendocino County, resident locally here. Um, and we know from some sort of historically groundbreaking experiments that were done back in the 60s that if you remove these uh, ochre sea stars from their coastal intertidal habitat, it allows mussel populations to quickly cover these rocky habitats. And, and the mussels in turn prevent other species from establishing themselves. So a, a, a sea star, a population of sea stars has really important indirect impacts on the many species that inhabit the rocky intertidal zone by removing clumps of mussels, thereby allowing other species to come into the system. So when sea stars are, are present, you have a much more diverse ecosystem than when the sea stars are absent. So because of their importance, their ecological importance, many scientists really became quickly alarmed when these top predators began disappearing a few years ago. Um, and so you right, might remember from back in 2013, millions of sea stars um, have basically wasted away into slime and piles of ossicles and goo like you see here in this picture due to a disease known as sea star wasting disease. Um, and this is, this is sort of a, a real nasty grizzly um, disease where symptoms start with these white lesions on the sea star, um, leading to a deflated body, slackening heartbeat, the arms start to fall off of the sea star, the organs start to rupture, and then eventually they end up dead in this, this sort of pile of goo. Um, and so this is a, a, a photo of an ochre sea star here that has succumbed to the disease. <clears throat> And so back in 2013, sea stars started dying off in droves, including here on the Lost Coast and, and in Humboldt County. Um, and while this disease has been seen in the past, it's never caused deaths so quickly or occurred at such a large scale or for as long as we, we saw between 2013 and 2015. Um, and during this time, more than 20 species of sea stars from Mexico all the way up to Alaska uh, were severely impacted. Um, and the sunflower sea star, which is another sea star that, that we used to see pretty commonly locally here, 
um, was particularly susceptible to this disease. And we lost about 80 to 100% of local populations um, along the entire 3,000 kilometer range uh, uh, that the sunflower star inhabits. So given the importance that sea stars have on their ecosystems, my lab, along with many others along the West Coast, uh, really wondered what the future of the inner tidal might look like without ochre sea stars. Remember the important impacts that ochre sea stars have on the, the inner tidal ecosystem by keeping muscle populations in check. They allow lots of other organisms to come in and inhabit the rocky inner tidal um, shoreline, increasing the diversity of the system. So without the sea stars around to keep the muscles in check, we could almost envision a future of an inner tidal much less diverse and, and sort of dominated by muscles. And so following the major wipeout of this, of this particular species from wasting disease in 2013, we wondered whether or not there might be any other predators in the system that could potentially step up to take over the major role as keystone predator um, in the absence of, of the ochre sea star. And what we found is that the answer on rocky shores, at least here in Northern California, could be yes. In fact, we found that rock crabs um, which inhabit the same rocky inner tidal zone as sea stars are also major predators of sea mussels. And so we did this experiment actually out on Cape Mendocino at this place we call Mussel Rock because of the abundance of mussels there. Um, what we did is we removed the few remaining sea stars that were left. And, and I can tell you in 2014 and 15, when we did this, there weren't many sea stars left there. Um, and we looked at the mortality of, of these California mussels in caged and uncaged plots on the shore. And we found that the survivorship of mussels in low tide zones that are frequented by crabs was significantly greater in cages. So the mussels that were in cages and protected from crabs survived quite well on, on the low shore, even though we don't commonly encounter them there. And the mussels that we had transplanted down to the low shore but didn't cage were quickly eaten up by crabs. And so <clears throat> the health of the ecosystem, even in the absence of the ochre sea stars, at least on Cape Mendocino, might be kept intact by predation by this other predator that often doesn't get um, the same type of notice as an important keystone predator in the inner tidal. So we like to think of, of the Cape Mendocino shore as having this built-in functional redundancy, this sort of backup predator that can also keep the mussels at bay. Um, the good news is that ochre sea stars seem to be recovering um, along with some resistance to the deadly disease. Um, but even though they're recovering in many parts of their range, really more time is needed before these populations are, are probably able to resume their role as keystone predators in their ecosystems. <clears throat> okay, so I just wanna switch gears one last time. We're gonna go from sea stars now to kelp. Um, and as some of you may know, bull kelp forests are, are one of the foundations of our nearshore coastal ecosystems along the, the Northern coast of California. And the floating canopy of this, of this kelp here that you see in this picture uh, provides shelter for young fish. And the kelp itself provides food for lots of very uh, valuable species, such as things like red abalone and red sea urchin. But another thing that we've really been interested in is whether or not bull kelp may actually help alleviate stress from ocean acidification on other um, species that exist within it or nearby it. So there's been really widespread speculation that submerged aquatic vegetation like kelp might protect coastal organisms and the ecosystems they inhabit by helping to alleviate the stress of low pH conditions associated with ocean acidification. And the reason for this is because aquatic plants and, and algae photosynthesize, right? And as they photosynthesize, what they're doing is they're removing carbon dioxide from the seawater. And what this does is decreases acidity, increases oxygen, and also increases calcium carbonate, all three of those things which can help marine organisms build and maintain their shells. <clears throat> 
And so with all the talk about uh, marine macrophytes like kelps and kelp forests protecting coastal environment from ocean acidification, we wanted to know under what circumstances is that true and to what extent. And, and so what we did is we went out into some local kelp forests, um, uh, both north and south of Cape Mendocino. So we, we looked at some kelp forests in Trinidad Harbor. And then we also looked at some kelp forests uh, near Portuguese Beach in Mendocino County. Oops, sorry about that. And what we did is we went out and we installed these sensor arrays, much like the arrays that we installed in the intertidal zone earlier in the talk, inside and outside of the kelp, at the top and at the bottom of the kelp, um, to measure how acidic and how oxygenated the water was in these different locations throughout the kelp growing season, with the intent of, of finding out if the kelp, through the process of photosynthesis, could actually change the, the chemistry of the seawater around it. And what we found is that near the ocean surface, the seawater was much less acidic in the kelp than outside of the kelp during the day when the kelp is photosynthesizing, suggesting that the kelp canopy can actually reduce the acidity of the seawater during the day. And so what this suggests is that kelp could actually mitigate some of the stress of ocean acidification and kind of serve as an ocean acidification oasis for canopy dwelling organisms like sea urchin larvae, juvenile rockfish, um, and other calcifying organisms that inhabit the canopy of the kelp forest. What we did find also though is that the effects didn't extend all the way down to the ocean floor. Much of the photosynthesis, as you might imagine, of the kelp happens in the canopy up near the surface. So we didn't see the effects at the bottom. Um, and we only saw the effects during the day when photosynthesis is actively happening. Um, and we also only saw those effects during the kelp growing season. So there are some potential limits to the benefits from kelp, but, but we do suggest that, that kelp might be this sort of haven from the stress of ocean acidification during certain times of the year and also during certain times of the day for some of these marine organisms that inhabit the kelp forest. So we're excited to continue this work uh, going forward. Um, and there's some urgency to this because it could provide yet another reason to, to help protect kelp. Um, as you may know, our kelp forests are in serious trouble in California. Um, they've decreased by up to about 93%, decreased up to about 93% of, of what's normal in the past five years. Um, and so higher sea surface temperatures in recent years have limited kelp growth. Um, sea star wasting disease has wiped out the sunflower star that I mentioned early, earlier. That's important because that sunflower star is a key predator of purple urchins. Um, and that's led to historical outbreaks of purple urchins that have led to further declines in, in California kelp forests. <clears throat> and the effects of the kelp forests really sort of reach from the ocean to the shore, right? So the, we know that the red abalone fishery has been closed down um, for several years now um, because the abalone have been severely impacted by the lack of food due to the lack of kelp. Um, fewer fish, uh, rockfish in particular, has meant fewer um, or less amount of food for things like shorebirds and marine mammals. Um, like harbor seals and sea lions. And so my lab and others at Cal Poly Humboldt are continuing to monitor the situation um, with kelp declines um, and rebounds as well on the North Coast. So with that, I'd like to just say thanks to all my collaborators and, and, and colleagues and support. Um, I, I would especially like to acknowledge the help of all my undergraduates at, at Humboldt State or Cal Poly Humboldt now. Um, and, and my funding and support. And I just want to thank you all for being here and for, for listening attentively uh, during my talk and happy to take any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Paul. That was great. And uh, so yeah, folks, we're gonna change the security settings here to allow people to unmute themselves. And uh, so anybody who has a question, uh, we'd love to hear from you, I guess. So uh, one question I had as I was listening to things, I was wondering as you look throughout California, particularly as it relates to mussels and um, 
I'm wondering in areas with lower pH and other areas of California where you see less upwelling and food, are you seeing um, different results in terms of the health of the muscle populations in, in places um, like that? Yeah, that's a great question. It really seems like food is the key. Um, and, and this idea that you know, muscles have experienced these sort of variable nearshore conditions throughout their evolutionary history. Um, and so we think they're pretty well adapted to these, these fluctuations in pH. And so long as they have abundant food, um, they do pretty well in resisting those stressors. Um, if food is scarce and less abundant, that's when we start to see the effects of the low pH on the muscles and their growth and their, their shell strength. Gotcha. So uh, we got a question from Max Gordon, who's joining us from Washington State, and he says, what role does BOEM play in your research? No, I'm, I'm horrible with acronyms, so I'm going to need to for you to tell me what that acronym is. Okay, well, in the meantime, uh, we will uh, see if anybody else uh, has uh, some questions. Uh, everybody can turn on their video now and uh, chime in with their audio if they want to ask directly or put it in the chat and uh, we'll address your question that way. So Max, if you're out there, our Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, one of the logos on the slides. Ah, great. So the um, that organization was involved in some of the ocean pH monitoring that was done, not by my lab, but for some of the historical data that was collected on um, ocean pH. Great, and it looks like we got a question. Uh, Andy, you got a question? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. I'm just, um, I'm uh, curious. Uh, the studies show a lot of great potential for knowledge and applying that knowledge to uh, improve um, habitats and species. Also, some of the stats you quoted, like 95% reduction in kelp and die off of all the stars and everything were pretty um, disconcerting. And I just wonder how in your own mind and heart and your outlook, um, you balance the promise you see in your studies and also the, um, the challenges to the environment you see in the, in the larger picture of things. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and that, that's a tough struggle every day, to be honest. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to maintain optimism. Um, you know, I, I guess what I do as a scientist, at least currently and, and recently, is sort of point out these potential issues or consequences of climate change. But um, I'm not necessarily doing anything with my research to help solve the problem, as I am more just pointing out potential issues. None of this goes away unless we stop burning fossil fuels. And um, until that that changes, um, it's kind of hard to, to maintain optimism for some of these problems that, that, are, that are going on. Um, but I will say that, you know, the one thing that, that has come out of this research that has surprised me and that, that does give me some optimism is the resilience of these, of these organisms and these systems, right? The muscles have, have, you know, adapted to these highly variable conditions. And it seems like they might not be as bad off as we originally thought. Um, the sea stars are starting to come back at one of the sites up in Crescent City. In 2014, the sea stars there were, were almost absent. And we have four times as many sea stars there now as we did a few years back. And those sea stars cool. seem to be much more resistant to the disease now than they were. And even here in Trinidad, the, the study that we did on the kelp forest in Trinidad Harbor, my, my poor graduate student um, had this great study planned and, and, and got out to, the, to where the kelp bed was in June and it was, it was gone. And, and she thought she didn't have a project to do. And then a few months later, it showed up and it's been there ever since. And, and, and we know that some of the kelp forests are actually returning to um, to healthy states. So I think nature is resilient. Um, I think we have to worry more about our future than uh, the rest of, of, of the natural world's future. I think nature will find a way to adapt and evolve. Um, 
but I think it would be good for us to stop making it so hard on them to do so. Thank you. Hmm. All right. So it uh, looks like, uh, Lindsay, you might have your mic off. Do you have a question? Or on, rather, your mic is on. I do have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I'm just curious about a very small factoid. I heard several years ago that Tamales Bay, uh, down in Point Reyes, where there was a great controversy about oysters, where a lot of oyster spat were raised, um, was having trouble raising its spat because of the acidification of that particular area. And that as a result, a lot of oyster spat were being raised here in Humboldt Bay. Is that true? Um, I, or the, the only part I can speak to there is oyster spat and oyster larvae are particularly vulnerable um, and susceptible to, to acidic waters. Um, and so in places where the water is highly acidic, those, those little baby oysters don't do too well. I don't know if any of those operations were moved to Humboldt as a result of that. I, that's, that's not something I'm familiar with. Um, it's, it would be interesting if that were the case. Um, Humboldt Bay, um, at least relative to the coastal waters here, is much more stable in terms of its pH regime. So you don't get those lar large fluctuations in the bay as you do on the outer coast. Um, so it's a bit more hospitable um, than the outer coast, but I don't know how it, how it is in relation to Tamales Bay. Just uh, to chime in a little bit, I remember a few years ago um, at the Oyster Festival, um, there was some publicity and, you know, celebration of uh, Humboldt Bay oysters, of course. And one factoid that I remember, <laughs> and it's, of course, my memory is as foggy as it can possibly be. But one thing that I remember was they said that Humboldt Bay is one of the major sources for oyster embryo on the West Coast. So. Yeah, Back check me, but I think that's what I remember. Yeah, I do know that several of the oyster growers here do provide spat and seed to other growers on the West Coast. Yeah, and that may be in part due to the, the conditions here. The best news is the variability in conditions north and south of the, the Great Divide. Yeah, well, and that could change, though, unfortunately. That's how it is now, and it's been how it's been historically. There are some warning signs that, that south of the Cape, things are getting a bit more acidic. Um, and without the food, especially for the mussels, that may be bad news for those mussels there. All right, it looks like yeah. Don has her hand up, and uh, then maybe Marsha after that. Go ahead, Don. I think you're muted. Don, you're up. If you, there you go. Maybe not. Marsha, I see you uh, turned your mic on. Did you have a question? Yes, I'm wondering about sea level rise. Maybe you covered it before I joined. Um, does that dilute the acidification? No, it wouldn't uh, necessarily. Um, I don't myself study sea level rise, although I'll give a shout out to Lori Richmond at, at Cal Poly Humboldt, who is sort of leading the charge on looking at the potential impacts of sea level rise in Humboldt County. Um, no, that same acidic water in the ocean now is gonna be the same acidic water that, that rises um, further onshore. Um, so if there is some sort of um, interaction with freshwater, um, then that could certainly change the acidity of the water, but um, it won't be diluted by rising per se. And, and if, if the, the sea rises the way they've, they've said, eight inches by 2050, right. does that mean that it, more rocks would possibly be uncovered or will um, mussel beds drown? Mm. Uh, the, the mussels themselves won't drown. They'll do okay because they would prefer to be underwater. The, the mussel beds will probably shift upward um, on the shore because as long as there's healthy sea stars and crabs, uh, 
the lower edge of the mussel bed is going to be kind of kept in check by those predators. So down below the water, the mussels get picked off pretty easily by the sea stars and the crabs. As the water gets higher, that means the lower edge of the bed is going to start shifting up um, the shore. So that's what we would predict for the, the mussels is they would get higher on the shore as the, as the sea level rises. And one last question. That seems to be an invasion of jellies right now. <laughs> what is their uh, role? That's a great question. Um, depending on who you talk to, there are some marine biologists that predict that under these sort of, so the water, the ocean is not just getting more acidic, it's also getting warmer, right? And uh, mm -hmm. jellies tend to do well in warm acidic water. And so part of the reason that we may see more and more jellies is because they do particularly well under those conditions. Um, and that's bad because uh, jellyfish will compete for some of the same resources that juvenile fish do. Um, and so they could compete with ecologically and also economically important fish species uh, in the future as they get more abundant. Thank you. Yeah. Great. It looks like uh, Dawn, uh, she was having issues getting uh, her mic turned on, but uh, I made her a co-host here. So let's see if that uh, changes anything. Otherwise, Dawn, maybe type your question into the chat if it still doesn't uh, let you ask your question with video on and audio. In the meantime, if there are other questions that folks have, uh, please feel free to chime in and uh, turn your mic off. and. Uh, video on if you want and, and let us know. I think I got it to work. <laughs> there, there, you go. there you are. That's an awesome talk. Thanks so much. I really appreciated the, the sort of entire perspective you gave today. Um, you know, the ocean's big place and, and ocean acidification is a big problem. And you were saying that how resilient these marine organisms are to that. And some are more so and some are less so. Um, in terms of any management decisions or management choices, is there, do you know, or what are the sort of, what's the outlook for management of these areas in relation to such a massive problem that we can't really grapple with? Yeah, I really, you know, <laughs> we as scientists so often talk about, you know, how our, our results might have some implications for management, but you know, as you mentioned, this is a gigantic ocean-wide problem, right? Yeah. So how do you manage um, something like that? Locally in California, this idea that marine macrophytes might provide some refuge for important calcifying organisms has been thrown out as a potential management idea. Like let's, let's restore kelp forests, let's restore seagrass habitats, let's restore some of these marine macrophytes so that we can create um, uh, more amenable habitats to these calcifying organisms. Um, but that approach has been questioned. Just the logistics of that is, is, is really difficult. And the benefits that they provide while they are real, I think are somewhat limited. Um, and I really think the only management strategy here is to stop burning fossil fuels and stop pumping CO2 here, here. in the atmosphere. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, it, it's, it's prevention rather than, than triage, I think, is the way to go. Yeah. My understanding is that, you know, ocean acidification, like once it starts to ramp up, is kind of hard to turn this very big ship. Back. And there's a lot of inertia. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. where are we on that trajectory? Are we... Like we talk about these, you know, global climate change of one centimeter is, is the sort of threshold. I mean, where are, I don't know what the threshold is for ocean acidity. Well, we're kind of right at that tipping point where we really need to start making changes or it's, it's not going to be easily turned back. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. All right. I see some folks still have their, uh, they're unmuted. So I don't know if that means you have more questions. If not, maybe uh, mic you or mute yourself again. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we open the floor to any more questions that are out there, either by chat or in person. Yeah. Did you have a question, Marsha? Or? 
it looks like we may be getting to the end of the question and answer period here. So um, unless there's anything else that folks want to ask, I think we'll uh, wrap this up and move into the, uh, the thank you outro portion of our lecture series. So uh, with that said, um, on behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and BLM King Range National Conservation Area, many thanks to Dr. Paul Bordeaux of Cal Poly Humboldt for this talk. We hope you found his lecture educational and inspiring and will join us again next Tuesday, March 1st from 6 to 7 p.m. for part two of our Marine Life of the Lost Coast lecture series. It will feature Dr. Don Goley presenting Marine Mammals of the North Coast, what we are learning about elephant seals, gray whales, and stranded marine mammals. Visit lostcoast.org for more information and Zoom links. Thanks again for tuning in tonight and to learn more about Friends of the Lost Coast or to make a donation to support our work, including programs like this lecture series, please visit our website at lostcoast.org. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Enjoy the rest of your evening and all the best from Friends of the Lost Coast. Thanks again, Dr. Paul Bordeaux and Cal Poly Humble. Thank you now. very much. Thanks, Paul. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.